from somebody whose company has financial problems to someone who has the prospect of a glittering and financially rewarding future. Every day some beautiful girl or other stares out from the pages of the daily newspapers. These girls are often tipped for stardom, or they're often seen with the stars, or they're seen in the right places, with the right people. It's hard to know in the communications world of the 70s whether they're advertisements or fantasies, whether they have talent or just vital statistics. But one girl stands out more than any of them, much more frequently and much more positively. And it's always the same story. She's the girl who's tipped to be the sex star of the 70s, and all that goes with it, money and fame included. She's a 24-year-old Norwegian actress. Behind her, all the machinery of filmmakers and agents of newspapers and television. Carefully chosen situations and symbols glamorize the product. So that eventually the product herself becomes the ultimate symbol of glamour. A world-famous star and the money that goes with it. She started as Miss Norway, became Penthouse Pet of the Month, and she's now being tipped as a sex star of the 70s. Yeah, definitely one Her personality belongs to the photographic studio, where she's coiffured in preparation for exposure to the masses, whose appetite for breasts and bottoms, nipples and navels, is amply titillated by Fleet Street's equal hunger for circulation. In two years, the amount of press coverage given to Julie Edge has risen to more than 2,000 column inches, 166 feet or 55 yards. And it's cost her agent nothing but time and thought. Pictures like these with Sasha Lee Stell made six papers without costing a penny. It helps to be seen with people who are already stars. After all, some of it may rub off. Her career would hardly merit such excesses of publicity. She's been in just three films. The critics haven't even noticed her, even though the press has been her best friend. <laughs> But while she's waiting in the wings for the movie men to make their offers, there's always the edge face and body to promote. It's a healthy body, and the personality that goes with it is unaffected, humorous, and unashamed. Keep, keep the head up, just keep it. Lean over more, more on the side. Yeah. 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 Really come over his head. Come on, get up much higher on it. Vitally important to the media's talent spotters. They can't afford to 
miss a future star, even if they get it wrong. So the cameras click and the free column inches pile up. They're an essential launching pad for a future of glittering financial return. It could be the Raquel Welch story all over again. that Julie really started her career. Not that she was mad about winning the title. Uh, I don't know if I enjoyed it. I thought it was very exciting, you know, from uh, my age. Uh, I was 17, I was 19 yet. And from a little town, you know. I took on to America, to New York, and the Washington Beach. You know, we went to the West House and everything. It was fantastic. And to Miami Beach. I was so impressed by all this, you know. Also the country girls over the way. Yeah, it was really a fantastic uh, experience. And after that, I came back to Stavango and I got married to a uh, farm. In fact, you got divorced from your other husband, didn't you? Yes. And what happened then? Um, I got married again. I uh, went to a dentist and I was hardly in love with the dentist and I married him. When you came to this country, were you still married to your dentist's husband? Yes, I was. Uh, I just got divorced four months ago, really. We've been married all the time. And you had been living over here with him, had you? No, not with him. He lives in Boston. So you've been doing some work over here? I've been doing some work over here, and I've been home. And then we had the board and all this. And, uh, and I don't know, we just... Uh, we got... Um, I changed and he, I thought he has changed a lot, and we live apart and all of a sudden we have nothing in common anymore, you know, and then we just thought it better to, to get to start the worst. But by then she had an agent in the center of London. Neither Julie nor her agent have made any real money from what she has done. Unlike Raquel Welch, the girl they think she might succeed, who can get a quarter of a million dollars a picture. Dennis Van Tau looks after Julie's career. How conscious do you promote and package a girl like Julie? Well, one starts with thinking what is one trying to aim for, what is what market is one trying to get her, to get her into. And uh, it, it was obvious that, that, that uh, when one took her to a, a party or anything, or a press conference, that uh, the photographers and the gossip writers were very anxious to talk to her. She became a sort of center of attraction, so one knew she had that side of it. And uh, the next thing was to prove that she, that she could act and that she was going to be a, a, a star personality. She wanted to be a big star. I, I can't think like that, you know, because um, all this has, I, has been very lucky, you know. It's been mostly luck. And, I have done my best, you know, but uh, at the beginning I don't know much about it, and it has been terribly lucky, though. Uh, if I had the, if, if I had the talent, if, if I, I must say if, because I don't know, you know. But if I had the talent, I would still not to be a big star. I'm a good actress, you know. You know? There's a suspicion that Julie Edge does have the talent, the talent of a sexy comedian. The first film in which she attracted the attention of the movie makers was Every Home Should Have One, in which she was a foreign au pair who played hell with Marty Feldman's domestic life. But she wasn't a star and still isn't. She got the parts for a man who's sure she has star quality, but doesn't quite know why. My agent, I was then a man pregnant, and he said that there's an inquiry for me. When will they have the baby? <laughs> and, um, I was at the bottom of the baby, so I started working in that film six weeks after that. Um, I just walked in and met the next gentleman and um, Jim Clark and a few other people, and they gave me the script and said I was looked like the part, you know. And this is it. Well, we have this couch here that we use for casting, but uh, she doesn't attract sit on. I'm sitting like myself at the time, and she just came to the door. We'd had terrible trouble trying to find a, an extremely sexy and attractive and amusing au pair to look after the Marty Feldman household in the film. And uh, Jim Clark, the director, and I had gone to Stockholm and looked at hundreds of young Swedes. 
and none of them seemed at all promising. And we came back having spent more money than we thought we could allow on the budget, really, and not got a girl in our hand. And then the authors, the original authors' agents, Milton John and um, Herbert Kretzler, I was talking to uh, about one of the problems on the phone and uh, said, have you got a Scandinavian girl? And he said, no. I think, in fact, Judy he thought was still pregnant at the time, and so it wouldn't be available really for being a sexy old pair girl. However, we rang back the next day, having found that she had actually, the baby had arrived, and she was available for interview. And she came in, and uh, it was quite obvious immediately that, uh, that she was going to work, provided she could speak a single line. And so we did a little test uh, with her and uh, an, an actor, and, uh, you know, she, could, she did the lines very well. Do you think she's going to become a star? That again, you see, all the people that I've, I've been associated in the early stages of their careers have been uh, actresses who, when I came upon them, had already learned a lot of their craft. Um, Judy is quite different in that she simply comes into the room and makes an impact. However, this is um, probably the thing, I think, which distinguishes a film performer from somebody who is also going to be able to perform in other media. And it's that, it's that immediacy. And the way that they come zinging off the screen, I don't see any reason why she shouldn't become a star. Although Ned Sherring gave Judy Edge her first film break, the man who gave her her second commands an audience of millions. The boss of Hammer Films, the specialist in celluloid horror, Sir James Carreras. Sir so James, how did you get hold of Judy Edge for your new movie? The creatures of the world forgot. Well, it all started um, in trying to repeat the success we had with One Million Years BC, where we introduced Raquel Welsh as the sex symbol, and then she became a world star. We were thinking of another title, and we came up with Creatures of the World Forgot, and this little illustrated poster. And then went round to see Columbia. They liked the idea, gave us a go ahead, so then we had the money to make the picture. And then with Columbia's publicity experts, we decided to run a competition to try and find a new Raquel Welsh. And they circularized through their offices all over the world, newspapers and everybody else, television, radio, that Hammer were looking for another Raquel Welsh. And we must have had about 2,000 replies, and from those 2,000 replies, we narrowed it down to 274 girls who all came to this office from all parts of the world, including America. And then one day, Julie Edge walked in, and really that was the end of the search, because she was so outstanding that we uh, decided then and then that this was who we wanted. <laughs> you said pretty emphatically that she's going to be the sex star of the seven years. Now, this is big stuff. <laughs> is she really going to be? I think she is already. I think she, she walks into any room. After we, uh, whenever we're launching one of these girls, uh, we get parties for them in either smart nightclubs or in hotels. And we present her to the hard boiled journalists and the hard boiled photographers who see all this before and they think, oh, you know, another hammer try to get a record rush. But this is, she takes that breath away. I, I mean, this, the reason we're getting all this publicity on her is because these people who got it in their power to give it are so impressed. And I think they think so too. The Carreras formula leaves nothing to chance. Hammer's glossy brochures of the sex in this edge will go to cinemas all over the world. Posters and stills of the edge body scantily clad have already attracted the world's press. Her part is simple, earthy, and unexacting. But the Barry Who could be worth a fortune to the girl who wants to make it. Hannah believes that their new film, Creatures the World Forgot, will make Julie a big star. There'll certainly be plenty of people to see it. What kind of audiences will see will see this new picture? Well, I I should say that every country in the world will play the picture. So she's going to be seen by an awful lot of people. By millions and millions and millions who already know about her. And this is the kind of film we'll see. It won't inspire film intellectual, but it's the formula that gave Raquel Welsh a boost to a quarter of a million dollars of film. Did you have a 
Uh, did you have a, a sort of serious speaking part in that film? No, we were clamping all the time. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think serious people were speaking at all, so we were grunting, making noises. Did you enjoy it? The grunting? <laughs> no. <laughs> <the> grunting. <laughs> well, I, I think it can be very good because it's very documentary with the right outfit and we are they're not, they're not glamorous about it. But it was very hard work and quite dangerous, I thought, you know. And a lot of climbing up and down, slippery um, waterfalls, and fighting and everything. I'm not used to all that, so I was terrified. I also had a psychic scene with a python snake, you know.